Please welcome your co-organizer of the month debates and your moderator for the evening, Rudyard Griffiths. Well, welcome to Toronto, Canada for the Monk debate on religion in association with the BBC and Intelligence Squared. I'm Rudyard Griffiths and it's my privilege uh, to be your moderator tonight. I want to begin by welcoming the worldwide audience of uh, the British Broadcasting Corporation, some 240 million people that will have access to this debate through the BBC World Service, BBC Online News, and BBC World News. Uh, it's just a fabulous opportunity to bring this debate to a truly global audience. I also want to welcome the tens of thousands of people watching this debate live and archived on monkdebates.com. It's terrific that they're part of this conversation too. And I also want to turn my attention to this hall, this spectacular hall, the lucky 2,700 people who are here in the flesh to listen to this debate tonight. Let it be said that on this day, thanks to the generosity of Peter and Melanie Monk, that Canada and its largest city, Toronto, is truly at the heart of the global conversation. Now, the moment we have all been waiting for. We have our motion before us, be it resolved, Religion is a force for good in the world. All we need is our debaters here center stage. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Tony Blair and Mr. Christopher Hitchens. Tony Blair was the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom from 1997 to 2007. Among his many international roles today, he is the Quartet Representative in the Middle East, working with the UN, the US, Russia and the EU to try to secure a lasting peace in the region. After leaving politics, Mr. Blair converted to Catholicism and he launched the Tony Blair Faith Foundation, a global initiative to promote respect and understanding among the world's major religions. Many of us in this room have read his recent best-selling memoir, A Journey, My Political Life. Christopher Hitchens is a British-born American author, journalist, and atheist. His regular Vanity Fair column, his prolific speeches and essays are central reading for anyone and everyone concerned about global affairs. Christopher has a number of best-selling books too. Obviously, God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything, and his recently published memoir, Hitch 22. Christopher was recently diagnosed with esophageal cancer and as such, we are doubly grateful that he and his family have joined us tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, your debaters. Before getting our debate underway, let me just briefly run down how the next hour and a half will unfold. Each debater has been given seven minutes for their opening remarks for and against the motion. Next, Mr. Hitchens and Mr. Blair will confront each other, head on, so to speak, through two rounds of formal rebuttals. We'll then bring you, the audience, into this debate through written questions. All of you received a written question card. At any time in the debate, fill that out. 
pass it down the aisle for collection. I'll also be taking some questions from audience members on the stage, some of the younger audience members here. Those questions will be asked directly to Mr. Blair and Mr. Hitchens. We'll also be bringing in our online audience through a series of questions, too. The debate will conclude with short five-minute closing statements and a second audience vote on the motion. But before I call on our debaters for their opening statements, let's find out how the 2,700 people in this audience voted as they came into the hall. We're going to get those numbers up on the screen now. 22% of you in favor of the motion, 57 opposed, and fully 21% of you undecided. Now, we also, as you know, asked you a second question tonight. We asked you, depending on what you hear during the debate, are you open to changing your vote? Let's have those numbers too, please. Wow. <laughs> 75% of this audience, three quarters, could change their vote depending what they hear in the next hour and a half. Ladies and gentlemen, we clearly have a debate on our hands. And remember, we will poll the audience again at the end of our proceedings to find out which of these two debaters was able to win by swaying us with the power of their arguments. Well, the time has come for introductory remarks. Christopher Hitchens, as we've agreed, you will begin first with your opening statement. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much to the Monk family, great philanthropists, for making this possible. Seven minutes, ladies and gentlemen, for the foundational argument between religion and philosophy. It leaves me hardly time to praise my distinguished opponent. In fact, I might have to seize a later chance of doing that. <laughs> um, I think three and a half minutes for metaphysics and three and a half for the material world won't be excessive. And I have a text. And I have a text, and it is from, because I won't take a religious text from a known extremist or fanatic, it's from Cardinal Newman. Uh, recently, uh, Prime Minister Blair's in, uh, urging, uh, beatified and on his way to canonization, a man whose apologia uh, made many Anglicans reconsider their fealty and made many people join the Roman Catholic Church, and is considered, I think rightly, a, a great Christian thinker. My text from the Apologia. The Catholic Church, said, uh, said Newman, holds it better for the sun and moon to drop from heaven, for the earth to fail, and for all the many millions on it to die in extremist agony than that one soul, I will not say will be lost, but should commit one venial sin, should tell one willful untruth, or should steal one farthing without excuse. You'll have to say it's beautifully phrased, ladies and gentlemen. But to me, and here's my proposition, what we have here, and picked from no mean source, is a distillation of precisely what is twisted and immoral in the faith mentality. It's essential fanaticism, its consideration of the human being as raw material, and its fantasy of purity. Once you assume a creator and a plan, it makes us objects in a cruel experiment whereby we are created sick and commanded to be well. I'll repeat that. Created sick and then ordered to be well. And over us to supervise this is installed a celestial dictatorship, a kind of divine North Korea. <laughs> greedy, exigent, exigent, I would say more than exigent, greedy for uncritical praise from dawn till dusk and swift to punish the original sins with which it so tenderly gifted us in the very first place. <laughs> However, let, let, the, let no one say there's no cure. Salvation is offered. Redemption, indeed, is promised at the low price of the surrender of your critical faculties. <laughs> Religion, it might be said, uh, must be said, uh, would have to admit, makes extraordinary claims, but though I would maintain that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, 
rather daringly provides not even ordinary evidence for its extraordinary supernatural claims. Therefore, we might begin by asking, and I'm asking my opponent as well as you when you consider your voting, is it good for the world to appeal to our credulity and not to our skepticism? Is it good for the world to worship a deity that takes sides in wars and human affairs? To appeal to our fear and to our guilt, is it good for the world? To our terror, our terror of death, is it good to appeal? To preach guilt and shame about the sexual act and the sexual relationship, is this good for the world? And asking yourself the while, are these really religious responsibilities, as I maintain they are? To terrify children with the image of hell and eternal punishment, not just of themselves, but of their parents and those they love. Perhaps worst of all, to consider women an inferior creation. Is that good for the world? And can you name me a religion that has not done that? To insist that we are created and not evolved in the face of all the evidence. To say that certain books of legend and myth, man-made and primitive, are revealed, not man-made code. Religion forces nice people to do unkind things and also makes intelligent people say stupid things. Handed a small baby for the first time, is it your first reaction to think, beautiful, almost perfect. Now please hand me the sharp stone for its genitalia that I may do the work of the Lord. No. <laughs> it is, uh, as, the great, um, as the great physicist Steven Weinberg has very aptly put it, in the ordinary moral universe, the good will do the best they can, the worst will do the worst they can, but if you want to make Good people do wicked things, you'll need religion. <laughs> now, I've got now one minute and 57 seconds to say why I think this is very self-evident in our material world. Let me ask Tony again, because he's here. Um, and because the, the place where he is seeking peace is the birthplace of monotheism. So you might think it was unusually filled with refulgence and love and peace. Everyone in the uh, civilized world has roughly agreed, including the majority of Arabs and Jews and the international community, that there should be enough room for two states for two peoples in the same land. I think we have a rough agreement on that. Why can't we get it? The UN can't get it. The US can't get it. The Quartet can't get it. The PLO can't get it. The Israeli parliament can't get it. Why can't they get it? Because the parties of God have a veto on it, and everybody knows that this is true. Because of the divine promises made about this territory, there will never be peace, there will never be compromise. There will instead be misery, shame, and tyranny, and people will kill each other's children for ancient books and caves and relics. And who is going to say that this is good for the world? And that's just the, argument, the example nearest to hand. Have you looked lately at the possibility that we used to discuss as children in fear? What will happen when, when messianic fanatics get hold of an apocalyptic weapon. Well, we're about to find that out as we watch the Islamic Republic of Iran and its party of God allies uh, make a dress rehearsal for precisely this. Have you looked lately at the revival of Tsarism in Putin's Russia, where the black-cowled, black-coated leadership of Russian Orthodoxy is draped over an increasingly xenophobic, tyrannical, expansionist and aggressive uh, regime. Have you looked lately at the teaching in Africa and the consequences of it of a church that says AIDS may be wicked but not as wicked as condoms? That's exactly no seconds left ladies and gentlemen. I've done my best. Believe me, I have more. Um, <laughs> Christopher, thank you for starting our debate. Mr. Blair, your opening remarks, please. Thank you. First of all, let me say it's a, a real pleasure uh, to be with you all this evening, to be back in Toronto. It's a particular privilege and honor to be uh, with Christopher in this debate. Um, let me first of all say that I do not regard the leader of North Korea as a religious icon. Uh, you will be delighted, delighted to know. Um, I'm going to make, um, it's a biblical number, seven, but I'm going to make seven points in my seven minutes. The first is this. It is undoubtedly true that people commit horrific acts of evil in the name of religion. It is also undoubtedly true that people do acts of extraordinary common good inspired by religion. 
Almost half of healthcare in Africa is delivered by faith-based organizations, saving millions of lives. A quarter of worldwide HIV AIDS care is provided by Catholic organizations. There is the fantastic work of Muslim and Jewish relief organizations. There are in Canada thousands of religious organizations that care for the mentally ill or disabled or disadvantaged or destitute. And here in Toronto, barely one and a half miles from here, is a shelter run by Covenant House, a Christian charity for homeless youth in Canada. So the proposition that religion is unadulterated poison is unsustainable. It can be destructive. It can also create a deep well of compassion and frequently does. And the second is that people are inspired to do such good by what I would say is the true essence of faith, which is along with doctrine and ritual particular to each faith, a basic belief common to all faiths in serving and loving God through serving and loving your fellow human beings. As witnessed by the life and teaching of Jesus, one of love, selflessness, and sacrifice, the meaning of the Torah. It was Rabbi Hillel who was once famously challenged by someone who said they would convert to religion if he could recite the whole of the Torah standing on one leg. He stood on one leg and said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That is the Torah. The rest is commentary. Now go and do it. <laughs> the teaching of Prophet Muhammad, saving one life it is as if you're saving the whole of humanity. The Hindu searching after selflessness, the Buddhist concepts of karuna, mudita, and metta, which all subjugate selfish desires to care for others, see consistence specifically on respect for others of another faith. That, in my view, is the true face of faith. And the values derived from this essence offer to many people a benign, positive, and progressive framework by which to live our daily lives, stimulating the impulse to do good, disciplining the propensity to be selfish and bad. And faith, defined in this way, is not simply faith as solace in times of need, though it can be, nor a relic of unthinking tradition, still less a piece of superstition or an explanation of biology. Instead, it answers a profound spiritual yearning, something we feel and sense instinctively. This is a spiritual presence, bigger, more important, more meaningful than just us alone, that has its own power separate from our power, and that even as the world's marvels multiply, makes us kneel in humility, not swagger in pride. And that if faith is seen in this way, science and religion are not incompatible, destined to fight each other until eventually the cool reason of science extinguishes the fanatical flames of religion. Rather, science educates us as to how the physical world is and how it functions, and faith educates us as to the purpose to which such knowledge is put, the values that should guide its use, and the limits of what science and technology can do, not to make our lives materially richer, but rather richer in spirit. And so, imagine indeed a world without religious faith, not just no place of worship, no prayer, no scripture, but no men or women who, because of their faith, dedicating their lives to others, showing forgiveness where otherwise they wouldn't, believing through their faith that even the weakest and most powerless have rights, and they have a duty to defend them. And yes, I agree, in a world without religion, the religious fanatics may be gone. But I ask you, would fanaticism be gone? And then realize that such an imagined vision of a world without religion is not in fact new. The 20th century was a century scarred by visions that had precisely that imagining in their vision and at their heart and gave us Hitler and Stalin and Pol Pot. In this vision, obedience to the will of God was for the weak it was the will of man that should dominate. So, I do not deny for a moment that religion can be a force for evil. 
but I claim that where it is, it is based essentially on a perversion of faith. And I assert that at least religion can also be a force for good. And where it is, that it's true to what I believe is the essence of faith. And I say that a world without religious faith would be spiritually, morally, and emotionally diminished. So, I know very well that you can point, and quite rightly Christopher does, to examples of where people have used religion to do things that are terrible and that have made the world a worse place. But I ask you not to judge all people of religious faith by those people any more than we would judge politics <laughs> by bad politicians. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or, indeed, journalists by bad journalists. <laughs> the question is, along with all the things that are wrong with religion, is there also something within it that helps the world to be better and people to do good? And I would submit there is. Thank you. Well, Tony, your training in Parliament, I can see, had you just perfectly landing that right on the seven-minute mark. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're moving into our rebuttal round, uh, and I'd like the audience to get engaged, to uh, applaud when they hear something that the debaters say that they like, and also to help me enforce uh, our time limits. So when you see that clock ticking down, uh, start applauding, and that'll move us through this uh, in an orderly uh, fashion. Um, so Christopher, it's now your opportunity in our first of two rebuttal rounds to respond to Mr. Blair. I drove four, is that right? Uh, there's two rounds of rebuttals. Uh, each of you has the opportunity to go back and forth. And yes, you have four minutes uh, for each speaker within each of those rounds, if that's not too confusing. That sounds all right. I've got four minutes. Yes. Yeah, good. <laughs> um, then hold your applause, for heaven's sake. Uh, <laughs> Well, now, in fairness, no one was arguing that religion should or will die out of the world. Um, and all I'm arguing is that it would be better if there was a great deal more by way of an outbreak of secularism. Um, logically, if Tony's right, I would be slightly better off, not much, but slightly better off, being a Wahhabi Muslim um, or a 12 -er Shia Muslim or a Jehovah's Witness than I am wallowing as I do. <laughs> in mere secularism. I'm, what I'm arguing, and really seriously, is what we need is a great deal more of one and a great deal less of the second. And I knew it would come up that we'd be told about charity. And I take this very seriously. Um, because we know, ladies and gentlemen, as it happens with the first generation of people who do really, what the cure for poverty really is. It eluded people for a long, long time. The cure for poverty has a name, in fact. It's called the empowerment of women. If you, if, you, if, you, if you give women some control over the rate at which they reproduce, if you give them some say, take them off the animal cycle of reproduction to which nature and some doctrine, religious doctrine, condemns them, and then if you'll throw in a handful of seeds perhaps and some credit, the floor, the floor of everything in that village, not just poverty, but education, uh, health and optimism will increase. It doesn't matter. Try it in Bangladesh, try it in Bolivia. It works. It works all the time. Name me one religion that stands for that, or ever has. Wherever you look in the world and you try to remove the shackles of ignorance and disease and stupidity from women, it is invariably the clerisy that stands in the way. Or in the case of... Um... <laughs> now, furthermore, if you're going to grant this to Catholic charities say, which I would hope are doing a lot of work in Africa. If I was a member of a church that had preached that AIDS was not as bad as condoms, I'd be putting some conscience money into Africa too, <laughs> I must say. But it won't bring, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be funny. I'm, if I was trying to be funny, you mistook me. It won't bring back the millions of people who've died wretched deaths because of that teaching that still goes on. I'd like to hear a word of apology from the religious about that, if it was on offer. After all, otherwise I'd be accused of judging them by the worst of them. And this isn't done, as Tony says so wrongly, in the name of religion. 
it's a direct precept, practice, and enforceable discipline of religion. Is it not, sir, in this case? I think you'll find that it is. But if you're going to say, all right, um, the Mormons will tell you the same. You may think it's a bit cracked to think that Joseph Smith found another Bible buried in upstate New York, <laughs> but you should see our missionaries in action. I'm not impressed. Um, I'd rather have no Mormons and no missionaries, quite honestly, and no Joseph Smith. Um, do we grant to Hamas and to Hezbollah, both of whom will tell you and incessantly do, look at our charitable work, without us, Effendi, the poor of Gaza, the poor of Lebanon, where would they be but for our And they're right. They do a great deal of charitable work. It's nothing compared to the harm that they do, but it's a great deal of work all the same. I, uh, I'm also familiar with the teachings of the great Rabbi Hillel. I even know where he plagiarized the story from, if he had access to the stuff. The, inj the injunction not to do to another what would be repulsive if done to yourself is found in the Analects of Confucius, if you want to date it. But actually, it's found in the heart of every person in this room. Everybody knows that much. We don't require divine permission to know right from wrong. We don't need tablets administered to us ten at a time in tablet form on pain of death to be able to have a moral argument. No. We have... We have, the reasoning, we have the reasoning and the moral suasion of Socrates and of our own abilities. We don't need dictatorship to give us uh, right from wrong, and that's my lot. Thank you. Uh, in the name of uh, fairness and equity, Mr. Blair, I'm going to give you uh, an additional 25 seconds for your first uh, rebuttal. First of all, um I don't think we should think that because you can point to examples of prejudice in the name of religion, that bigotry and prejudice and wrongdoing are wholly owned subsidiaries of religion. There are plenty of examples of prejudice against women, against gay people, against others that come from outside the world of religion. And the claim that I make is not that everything the church has done in Africa is right. But let me tell you one thing it did do, and it did it whilst I was Prime Minister of the UK. The church has together formed a campaign for the cancellation of debt. They came together, they succeeded, and the first beneficiaries of the cancellation of debt were young girls going to school in Africa because for the first time they had free primary education. So I agree that not everything the church or the religious communities have done around the world is right. But I do say, at least accept, that there are people doing great work, day in, day out, who genuinely are not prejudiced or bigoted, but are working with people who are afflicted by famine and disease and poverty, and they are doing it inspired by their faith. And of course it's the case that not everybody... <laughs> of course it's the case that you do not have to be a person of faith in order to do good work. I've never claimed that. I would never claim that. You know, I know lots of people, many, many people, who are people not of faith at all, but who do fantastic and decent work for their communities and for the world. My claim is just very simple. There are, nonetheless, people who are inspired by their faith to do good. I mean, I think of people I met at some time ago in South Africa, nuns who were looking after children that were born with HIV AIDS. Now these are people who are working and, and, and living alongside and caring for people inspired by their faith. Is it possible for them to have done that without their religious faith? Of course it's possible for them to have done it, but the fact is that's what motivated them. So what I say to you is at least look, what we shouldn't do is end up in a situation where we say, right, we've got six hospices here and one suicide bomber there, and how does it all equalize out? That's not a very productive way of, of, of arguing this. And actually, I thought one of the most inter interesting things that Christopher said is that we're not going to drive religion out of the world. And that's true, we're not. And actually, I think for people of faith to have debates 
with those who are secularists is actually good and right and healthy, and it's what we should be doing. <laughs> and I'm not claiming that everyone should congregate on my space. I'm simply claiming one very simple thing, that if we can't drive religion out of the world, because many people of faith believe it and believe it very deeply, let's at least see how we do make religion a force for good, how we do encourage those people of faith who are trying to do good, and how we unite those against those who want to pervert religion and turn it into a badge of identity used in opposition to others. So, I would simply finish by saying this. There are many situations where faith has done wrong. But there are many situations in which wrong has been done without religion playing any part in it at all. So let us not condemn all people of religious faith because of the bigotry or prejudice shown by some, and let us at least acknowledge that some good has come out of religion and that we should celebrate. Christopher, your second rebuttal, please. Oh, I have a second one. You have a second one. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's an amazing test, a test of uh, audience uh, tolerance. Well, all right. Well, how splendidly you notice we progress, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Now it's okay. Some religious people are sort of all right. Um, I think I see to be bargaining uh, one of the greatest statesmen of the recent past down a bit. Um, not uh, necessarily opposed to that. Um, just to finish on the charity point, I once did a lot of work with a man called Sebastio Salgado. Some of you will know him, great man, great photographer, who's the UNICEF ambassador on polio questions. I went to Calcutta with him elsewhere. Nearly got rid of polio, nearly got rid of polio, um, nearly made it join smallpox as a disease, a, a thing of the past, a filthy memory, except for so many religious groups in Bengal and elsewhere, Afghanistan, West Africa, so on, telling their children, don't go and take the drops. It's a conspiracy, it's against God, um, it's against God's design. By the way, that argument isn't terribly new. Uh, when smallpox was a scourge, um, Timothy Dwight, the great divine who was the head of Yale, said taking J Dr. Jenner's injection was, a, was an interference with God's design as well. That's sort of, by the way, um, you need something like UNICEF to get major work done if you want to alleviate poverty and misery and disease. And for me, my money will always go to organizations like Médecins Sans Frontières, uh, like, um, <laughs> like, like Oxfam and many others, who, strange enough, go out into the world, do good for their fellow creatures for its own sake. They don't take... No. They don't take the Bible along, as people do to Haiti all the time. We keep catching them doing it. Their, 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 money, is being, their money is being spent flat out on proselytization. It's a function of the old thing that was hand in hand with imperialism. It's the missionary tradition. They can call it charity if they will, but it doesn't stand a second look. So, so much on the, the business of doing good, except perhaps to add, since I have you for some extra minutes, that Mr. Blair and I at different times gave quite a lot of our, our years to the Labour Party and to the Labour movement. And if the promise of religion was true, had been true, right up until the late 19th century in, say, Britain or North America or Canada, that good works are what's required and, and, and should be enough, and those who give charity should be honoured, those who receive it should be grateful, two rather revolting ideas in one, I have to say, <laughs> there would be no need for human and social and political action. We could rely on being innately good, which we know we can't rely upon, which I never suggested that we could or should. So, now what would, now I'm intrigued now. Uh, so religion could be a good thing after all. Sometimes we think, it's so now the proposition. What would, it, what would religion have to do to get that far? Well, I think it would have to give up all supernatural claims. It would have to say, <laughs> Please, it would have to say, 
No, you are not to do this under the threat of reward, heaven, or the terror of punishment, hell. No, we can't offer you miracles. Find me the church that will say, forget all that. Faith healing, no. Uh, it would have to give that up. It would have to give up the idea of an eternal, unalterable authority figure who was judge, jury, and executioner against whom there could be no appeal and who wasn't finished with you even when you died. <laughs> Do you, that's quite a lot for religion to give up, don't you think? <laughs> but who would not say it would be better off without it if it was what Tony Blair would like it to be? An aspect of humanism, an aspect of compassion, an aspect of the realizations of human solidarity, the knowledge that we are in fact all bound up one with another, that we have responsibilities to one, one to another, and that as I do when I give blood, partly because I don't lose the pint forever, um, I can always get it back, but <laughs> that there's actually a sense of pleasure to be had in helping your fellow creature. I think that should be enough. Thank you. Tony, it must feel like the House of Commons all over again. I don't know. So far, they're a little politer, actually. <laughs> um, um, Your but, final rebuttal, please. Yeah. It all depends, I guess, what your experience of uh, religious people is. I mean, my experience of the people I was uh, with last uh, week in, in, in Africa that, that, that include um, deeply religious people is not actually that they're doing what they're doing because of heaven and hell, they're doing it um, for love of their fellow human beings. And that's, I think, something very fine. What's more, that they, they believe and that, that this love of their fellow human beings is bound up with their faith. So it's not something, you know, yes, of course, it is absolutely true. They might decide to do this irrespective of the fact that they have religious faith, but their faith, they feel, is an impulse to do that good. And, you know, I don't recognize the description of the work that they do in, in what Christopher said. In Sierra Leone, where I was, you have Christians and Muslims working together to deliver health care in that country. But that's religion playing a positive role. They're working across the faith divide and doing it because they, again, believe that their faith impels them to do that. When we look back in history, yes, of course, you can see plenty of examples of where religion has played a negative role. You can see great examples, for example, in the abolition of slavery, where religious reformers joined with secular reformers in order to bring about the abolition of slavery. And let's get away from this idea that religion created poverty. You know, there, there, are, there are bad things that have happened in the world outside of religion. Right? And when you look at the 20th century, and you see the great scars of political ideology around views that had absolutely dramatically at their heart fascism, the communism of Stalin, absolutely at their heart was the eradication of religion. Then what I would say to you is, get rid of religion, but you're not going to get rid of fanaticism, and you're not going to get rid of the wrong in the world. So the question is, the question is, how then do we make sense of religion having this vital part in the world today since it is growing and not diminishing? How do we make sense of this? And this is where, yes, there is an obligation on the people of faith to try and join across the faith divide with those of other faiths. That's the reason for my foundation. We have people of different religious faiths. We've actually got a program where young people team up with each other of different faiths. Um, and work together in Africa on malaria back in their own faith communities and here in, in Canada. We have a schools program that allows schools to link up using the technology so that kids of different faiths can talk to each other across the world. And here's the thing. When they start to talk about their faith, they don't actually talk in terms of heaven and hell and a God that's an executioner of those that do wrong. They talk in terms of their basic feeling that love of God can be expressed best through love of neighbor and actions in furtherance of the compassion and help needed by others. And this is, this is, 
In 2007, you know, religious organizations in the US gave one and a half times the amount of aid that USAID did. Not insignificant. So my point is very, very simple. You can list all the faults of religion, just as you can list the faults of the politicians, the journalists, and any other profession. But for people of faith, the reason why they try to do good, and when they do it, is because their faith motivates them to do so. And that is genuinely the proper face of faith. Well, gentlemen, thank you for a terrific start to this debate. Uh, the time has now come to involve you, the audience, here uh, at Roy Thompson Hall. Those written questions have been coming in, uh, and some have been passed on to me uh, and our folks in the control room. Also, we're going to bring on uh, our online audience through questions that have been debated on our discussion boards, and I'm going to take some live questions from some younger audience members here on the stage. And in that regard, uh, Christopher, we're going to start with a question uh, from you. It's a young woman right here who uh, would like to address you personally. Tell the audience uh, your name and uh, your question, please. Um, hi, my name is Mako Adwani. Just hold on a sec. We're going to get this microphone working. Okay. Is this microphone working? Try again. Hello? You got it. Okay. Um, my name is Mako Adwani. I'm a recent graduate from the University of Toronto. And my question is actually in regards to globalization. This century, globalization will bring together, as never before, nations and peoples divided by wealth, geography, politics, and race. So my question is, instead of fearing faith, why not embrace the shared values of the world's major religions as a way of uniting humankind? Great question. Christopher? Yeah. Well, unity out of faith? Perf or perfectly disunity. Good, perfectly good question, but sounded seemed to be phrased as a call for common humanism. I mean, there's no, I didn't hear anyone say, wouldn't it be better if everyone at least joins at some church or other? Not a bit of it. I mean, uh, common humanism is, I think, not made particularly easier by the practice of religion, and I'll tell you why. There's something about religion that uh, uh, is uh, very often, at any rate, and in its original monotheistic, Judaistic form, actually is ab initio um, an expression of exclusivism. This is our God. This is the God who's made a covenant with our tribe. You find it all over the place. It isn't always as sectarian as foundational fundamentalist Judaism was, and sometimes still is, but it's not unknown. I mean, it's always struck me as slightly absurd to be a special church for English people, though I can sort of see the point. Um, <laughs> it strikes me as, it strikes me as, positively sinister that Pope Benedict should want to restore the Catholic Church to the claim it used to make, which is that it is the one true church, and that all, the, all other forms of Christianity are, as he still puts it, defective and inadequate. How this helps to build your future world of cooperation and understanding is not known to me. If you, if I, if you tell me in the Balkans what your religion is, I can tell you what your nationality is. You're not, you're not a Catholic. You know less about Loyola than I do. But I know you're a Croat, um, and I know you're a Croat nationalist. It's a tr religion, and, f and in fact, any form of faith, because it is a surrender of reason, it's a surrender of reason in favor of faith, is a fantastic false mul force multiplier, a tremendous intensifier, I was trying to say, um, of all things that are, in fact, divisive rather than inclusive. And that's why its history is so stained with blood, not just a, of crimes against humanity, crimes against womanhood, crimes against reason and science, uh, attacks upon medicine and enlightenment, all these appalling things that Tony kept defending himself from that I didn't even have time to bring up. Um, <laughs> but no, but if you just look at the way the Christians love each other in the wars of religion in Lebanon uh, or, in, or in, in former Yugoslavia, you will see that there is no conceivable way that by calling on the supernatural um, you will achieve anything like your objective of a common humanism, which is, I think you're quite right to say, our only chance of, I won't call it salvation. Thank you.
Now, Tony, what I'd like you to do, there's another question on the stage. Someone, in a sense, has the inverse question for you, and it'd be a great opportunity for you to respond to Hitchens at the same time. So let me go to uh, Emily Padden, a Trudeau scholar at Oxford University, who has a question for you, Mr. Blair. Thank you very much. My research is an armed conflict in sub-Saharan Africa, and so the question I'd like to ask you, Mr. Blair, if I may, is how do you argue that religion is a force for good in the world when the same faiths that bind peoples and groups also deepen divisions and exacerbate conflict? Great question. To which my answer is that they, they can do, and there are very many examples of that. But there are also examples, let me give you one from the Northern Ireland peace process, where in the end, actually, people from Protestant Catholic churches got together, and actually the religious leaders of those two churches tried to bring about a situation where people reached out across the faith divide. And so, what I would say to you is that, that this exclusivism is not, you know, it, it, this type of excluding other people because they're different, let, let's just nail the myth that this is solely the prerogative of religion. I'm afraid this happens in many, many different walks of life. It's not what true religion is about. True religion is not about excluding somebody because they're different. True religion is actually about embracing someone who is different. That is why, you know, in every major religion, this concept of love of neighbor, and uh, Christopher is absolutely right, Confucius um, did indeed say exactly something similar to Rabbi Hillel. Of course, Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. If you look at Hinduism, Buddhism, um, the religion of, of Islam, after the, the death of the Prophet Muhammad, Islam was actually at the forefront of science, was at the forefront of introducing proper rights for women for the first time um, in, in, in that part of the world. So the point is this, and this is really where the debate comes to. Christopher says, well, humanism is enough. And what I say to that is, but for some people of faith, it isn't enough. They actually believe that there is indeed a different and higher power simply than, than humanity. And that is not about them thinking of heaven and hell in some sort of old-fashioned sense of trying to terrorize people into submission to religion. They actually think of it as about how you fulfill your purpose as a human being in the service of others. And so, you know, when we say, well, that could be done by humanism, yes, it could. But the fact is, for many people, it's driven by faith. And so, yes, it's true, you can find examples of where religion has deepened the divide in countries in South Sub-Saharan Africa. You can also find examples of where religion has tried to overcome those divides by preaching what is the true message of religion, which is one of human compassion and love. Uh, Hitchens, let's have you come back on that, because not just, not just Northern Ireland, but Iraq, a war that you supported, religion played a, a, an important role, arguably, in the success of uh, putting together post-invasion Iraq. If I, um, if I only think we should do this because the two questions were, in effect, the same and both very well phrased, um, and because I'd never like to miss a, a chance to congratulate someone on being humorous, if only unintentionally. For, it's very touching for Tony to say that he recently went to a meeting that bridged a religious divide in Northern Ireland. Well, where does the religious divide come from? <laughs> 400 years and more, 400 years and more in my own country of birth of people killing each other's children, depending on what kind of Christian they were, and sending each other's children in rhetoric to hell and remaking Northern Ireland the place the most remarkable in, in Northern Europe for unemployment, for ignorance, for poverty, and for, I would say, stupidity too. Um, and for them now to say, maybe we might consider breaching this uh, gap, well, I should bloody well think so. <laughs> but I don't see how. What, if they'd listen to the atheist community in Northern Ireland, which is a real thing, and if they'd listen to the secular movement in Northern Ireland, which is a real thing, and I know so many people who've suffered dreadfully from membership in it, not excluding being pulled out of a car by a man in a balaclava and asked, are you Catholic or Protestant? He said, I'm Jewish atheist, actually. He said, what, what are you, a Protestant Jewish atheist or a Catholic? <laughs> you laugh. You laugh, you laugh, but it's not so funny. 
when the party of God has a gun in your ear at the same time. And that was in Britain, and still is to some extent, until recently. Rwanda, do I say that there would be no quarrel between Hutu and Tutsi, people in Rwanda? Belgian colonialism, I think, made it worse, probably, but there are no doubt innate ethnic differences, or the felt to be in Rwanda. Um, but the fact of the matter is, Rwanda is the most Christian country in Africa. In fact, by one account, it's in, that's, that's to say numbers of people in relation to numbers of churches, it's the most Christian country in the world. And the Hutu power genocide, at any rate, was preached from the pulpits, actually the pulpits of the Catholic Church, as many of the people we are still looking for wanted in that genocide, are hiding in the Vatican, along with a number of other people who should be given up to international justice, by the way. Quite a number of people. So, since Tony seems to like religious people best when they're largely non-practicing, but just basically faithful, I'll grant him that much. I say that it's not entirely the fault of religion that this happened in Rwanda, but when it's preached from the pulpit, as it was in Northern Ireland and in Rwanda, it does tend to make it very, very much worse. Thank you. Tony, just briefly come back on that because you were intimately involved in the search for, for peace in Northern Ireland, and I assume you had a very different perspective of the role that faith played in the resolution of that conflict. Yeah, and I, I work uh, now, uh, do work in, in, in Rwanda. Look, first of all, I, I think it really would be bizarre to say that the conflict in Rwanda was a result of the Catholic Church. Uh, I mean, it, 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 the, the, Rwanda was a, Rwanda is a perfect indicator of what I'm saying, which is you can put aside religion and still have the most terrible things happen. I mean, this was the worst genocide since the Holocaust. It was committed on a tribal basis. Yes, it's true. There were members of the Catholic Church who behaved badly in um, that context of Rwanda. There were also, by the way, members of the Catholic Church and others of religious de denomination who stood up and protected and died alongside people in Rwanda. So, you know, you... you... And as for Northern Ireland, yes, I, I, of course, Protestant and Catholic, absolutely right, but you couldn't ignore the politics of the situation in Northern Ireland was to do with the relationship between uh, Britain and Ireland going back over many, many centuries. So my, my point is very simple. Of course religion has played a role and sometimes a very bad role in these situations, but not only religion. Yeah. And what is at the heart of this is we wouldn't dream of condemning all of politics because politics had led to Hitler or Stalin or indeed um, what has happened in Rwanda. So let us not condemn the whole of religion or say that religion, when you look at it as a whole, is a force for bad because there are examples of where religion has had that impact. And so my, my I think actually Rwanda and Northern Ireland are classic examples of even the Middle East peace process. I mean, yes, I agree you can look at all the religious issues there, but let's not ignore the political issues either. And frankly, at the moment, the reason, and I can tell you this from first-hand, well, but I can tell you from first-hand experience, the reason we don't have a, an agreement at the moment between Palestinians and Israelis is not to do with the religious leaders on either side, right? It's a lot more to do with the political leaders, so it's my branch uh, that has to take um, um, the blame for that. And, and therefore, what I would say is, I actually think um, that, yes, of course, a lot of these conflicts have religious roots, um, I actually think it's possible for religious leaders to play a positive part in trying to resolve those. But in the end, it's for politics and religion to try and work out a way in which religion, in a world of globalization that is pushing people together, can play a positive rather than negative role. And if we concentrated on that, rather than trying to drive religion out, which is futile, but concentrate instead on how we actually get people of different faiths working together, learning from each other and living with each other, I think it would be a more, a more productive mission. Thank you. Okay, let's... Um, question. We like the applauding, so please continue that throughout the debate. Let's take a written question. My producers are telling me that we have uh, a written question. We'll get that on the screen. And Christopher, this is for you to start with. Um, interesting one. America is both one of the most religious countries in the world and also one of the most 
democratic and pluralistic, both now and arguably through much of its history. How do you explain that, that seeming paradox? Um, relatively uh, simply, um, the United States has uniquely um, a constitution that forbids the government to take sides in any religious matter or to sponsor a church or to adopt any form of faith itself. As a result of which, anyone who wants to practice their religion in America has to do it as a volunteer. Uh, it's what J de Tocqueville wrote about so well in his democracy in America. Um, ever since Thomas Jefferson wrote to the Baptists of Danbury, Connecticut, um, during his tenure as president, saying, uh, you'll be familiar with the phrase, I'm sure, uh, be uh, rest assured, because they'd written to him out of their fear of persecution in Connecticut, rest assured that there will ever be a wall of separation between the church and the state in this country. And the maintenance of that wall, which people like me have to defend every day against those who want garbage taught in schools and pseudoscience in the name of Christ um, and other atrocities. The, the maintenance of that wall is the guarantee of the, of the democracy. By the way, um, for a bonus, can anyone tell me who the Baptists of Danbury, Connecticut thought was persecuting them? The Congregationalists of Danbury, Connecticut. Well done. <laughs> also, th that argues, by the way, for the existence of a very small but real fan base of mine somewhere in this <laughs> Um Yes, now, it, it doesn't seem to matter very much now, but it mattered then. Give those Congregationalists enough power, as they did have in Connecticut. And just you see how unfurry they look compared to how docile they behave. Now we've disciplined them. Thank you. <laughs> Well, Tony, let me come to you with that same question. Is, is it just a case of American exceptionalism, or is this balance between pluralism and faith that's been achieved in America something that you're either seeing in other parts of the world or a model that could be exported globally? Well, I think that what most people want to see is a situation where people of faith are, are, are able to speak in the public sphere but are not able to dictate. And, and that is a, a reasonable um, balance, and I think that most... <laughs> You know, most people would, would accept. Um, but I think, you, you know, again, what I would say about uh, examples of where you, you get religious people that are, are fanatical in the views that they want to, to press on others, you know, fanaticism is not, as I say, it's not a wholly owned subsidiary of religion, I'm afraid. It can happen outside of religion too. So the question is, how do people of, of if, if you like, good faith, who believe in pluralist democracy, how do we ensure uh, that people who, who hold faith uh, deeply um, are able to participate in society and have the same ability to do that as everyone else um, without being kind of denigrated, but at the same time have to respect the fact that ultimately democracy is about the will of the people and the will of the people as a whole. So um, I, I think that you know, most people can, can get that balance right. Um, and you know, we are very lucky actually um, in our countries because we, we are in a situation where people of different faiths um, are free to, to practice their faith as they like. And that is, in my view, an absolutely fundamental part of democracy. And it's something that people of religious faith have to be very clear about and stand up and do. And one of the reasons why, you know, for me, I think it's, um, it's actually important for people of religious faith to have people like Christopher challenge us and say, okay, this is how we see religion. Now you get out there and, and tell us how it's different and where it isn't different, how you're gonna make it so. And I think that's a, a, a positive and, and good thing. All I ask for is that where people of faith are speaking in the public sphere, then people accept that we have a right to do that and that sometimes we do that actually because we believe um, in the things that we're saying and we're not trying to subvert or change democracy. On the contrary, we simply want to be part of it and our voice is a voice that has a right to be heard alongside the voice of others. Well, I see Christopher uh, writing furiously, so I'm gonna ask him to come back uh, on that point. Um, well, I hadn't done anything special to add there. I, I, I think I'd rather give another person a chance for a question. Okay. Well, uh, it's, it's a question that was debated for you, Christopher, on uh, monkdebates.com in the lead-up uh, to this evening. 
uh, on our discussion board, many, pe many people saying that religion provides a sense of community. Uh, in, a, in modern societies where uh, immersed in a consumer culture, uh, more often than not living alongside fellow citizens who are more maybe self-directed than other-directed, what do you say about the, 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 the pure community function of religion? Isn't that a public good, a valid public good oh, of well, religious belief? Absolutely. I say, I say good luck to it. Um, um, the way I phrase it in my book, <clears throat> available at fine bookstores everywhere, <laughs> is that I, I propose a pact uh, with, the, with the faith, the faithful. Say, I, I, I'll take it again, I'll quote from the great Thomas Jefferson, that I don't mind if my neighbor believes in 15 gods or in none, he neither by that breaks my leg or picks my pocket. Um, I would echo that and say that as long as you don't want your religion taught to my children in school, given a government subsidy, imposed on me by violence, any of these things, you are fine by me. I would prefer... I would prefer not even to know what it is that you do in that... <laughs> church of yours. Well, I don't, in fact, if you force it on my attention, I will consider it a breach of that pact. Have your own bloody Christmas and so on. <laughs> do, your, do your slaughtering, if possible, in an abattoir and don't mutilate the genitals of your children. <laughs> because then I'm afraid it gets within the ambit of law. All right, so that's, a, don't you think that's reasonably pluralistic and communitarian of me? I think it is. Why is it a vain hope on my part? Why is that? Has this pact ever been honored by the other side? Of course not. And it's a mystery to me, and I'll share it with you. Um, if I believed that there was a savior uh, who'd been appointed or sent by, or, or a prophet, uh, appointed or sent by a God who bore me in mind and loved me and wa wanted the best for me, if I believed that, and that I possessed the means of grace and the hope of glory, to phrase it like that, I think, I don't know, but I think I might be happy. They say it's the way to happiness. Why doesn't it make them happy? <laughs> well, don't you think it's a perfectly decent uh, question? Why doesn't it? Because they won't be happy till you believe it too. And why is that? Because that's what their holy books tell them. <laughs> now, I'm sorry, it's enough with saying in the name of religion. Do these texts say that until every knee bows at the name of Jesus and so on, there will be no happiness? Of course it is what they say. It isn't uh, just a, a private belief. Um, it is rather, and I think always has been, and it's why I'm here, uh, actually a threat to the idea of a peaceable uh, community. And very often, a very, as now and, and frequently, a very palpable one. So I think that's, that's the underlying energy that, that powers the friendly disagreement between Tony and myself. Tony, would you like to come back on that topic of religion and community or move on to uh, another question? Join Let's me. move on. Um, also on our, our website, uh, big discussion around the topic of uh, religion and its role in the invasion of Iraq. And Mr. Blair, the, the question is for you, and it's about something um, that many people posted about something you said once about the interplay of religion and politics. And to quote, quote you directly, you said, what faith can do is not tell you what is right, but give you the strength to do it. The question being, what role did faith play in your most important decision as prime minister, the invasion of Iraq? I think we can nail this one pretty easily. It was not about religious faith. And you know, one of the things that I sometimes say to people is, is look, the thing about religion and religious faith is if you are a person of faith, it's, it's, it's part of your character. It, it defines you in many ways as a human being. It, it doesn't do the policy answers, I'm afraid. Okay? So as I used to say to people, you know, you don't go into church and, and look heavenward and say to God right next year, the minimum wage, is it £6.50 or £7? <laughs> Unfortunately, it doesn't tell you the answer. Uh, and even on the major decisions that are to do with war and peace that I've taken, 
Um, they were decisions based on policy, and so they should be, and you may disagree with those decisions, but they were taken because I genuinely believe them to be right. So, Christopher, the natural follow-on question to you is, how did you square the circle, or maybe you didn't, between your support for the Iraq War and, let's say, the current then-president, uh, George W. Bush, and his very public evocation of faith uh, in terms of his rhetoric uh, around the invasion? Well, I don't remember. In fact, I don't think you can point out to me any moment where George Bush said he was under divine uh, order or had any divine warrant for the intervention in Iraq. I, I'm, in fact, oh, I'm perfectly he, certain that he might not have minded at some points giving that impression, but he, tried, he wanted to give that impression about everything that he did. Um, <laughs> George, Bush, George, Bush is, George Bush is someone who, as with his uh, immediate predecessor, after various experiments in faith, ended up in his wife's church, um, most com comfortable place for him to be. Um, she's, after the one, she's, after all, is the one who said to him, if you take another drink, you scumbag, I'm leaving and taking the kids. <laughs> Which is his way of saying he found Jesus and gave up the bottle. <laughs> we know this, we, know, we, we know this to be true. Now, and, and, like, a good, and as, like a good Methodist, I was in Methodist school for many years myself, like a good Methodist, George Bush says the following, I've done all I can with this argument and with this conflict. From now on, all is in God's hands. That's quite different, I think. Would have made him a perfectly good Muslim, as a matter of fact. <laughs> Combination of fatalism with a slightly sinister feeling of being chosen. Anyway. <laughs> no, what was surely what's striking, to the, striking most to the eye of those who observed the debate on what Tony Blair and I agree to call the liberation of Iraq is the unanimous opposition of the leadership of every single Christian church to it including the, prime, the president's own, and the, now the prime minister's own. Uh, the Methodist Church in the United States adamantly opposed, the Vatican adamantly opposed, as it had been to the liberation of Kuwait in 1991. Um, a, 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 not the first time in the world that a sort of sickly Christian passivity has been preached in the face of fascist dictatorship. And of course, um, <laughs> I was very surprised by the number of liberal Jews who took the same about a regime that harbored genocidal thoughts towards them. And if it comes to that, but I'm not the arbiter of what's rational in the mind of the religious thinker, given the number of Muslims put to the sword by Saddam Hussein's regime, quite extraordinary to see the extent to which Muslim fundamentalists um, flock to his defense. But I don't expect integrity or consistency from those quarters. <laughs> but those of us... Those of us who worked with, the, uh, with people, with Iraqi intellectuals like Kanan Makia, um, with the Kurdish leadership, the secular left opposition of the uh, popular, uh, the, excuse me, the, the uh, Patriotic Union of Kurdistan, um, the Iraqi Communist Party, I have to give it credit for this, um, many f feminists and other secular who'd worked for years to bring down Saddam Hussein, are very proud of our solidarity with those comrades, those brothers and sisters. We're still in touch with them. We have nothing to apologize for. It's those who would have kept uh, a cannibal and a Caligula and a professional sadist in power who have the explaining to do. Thank you. Well, I want to be conscious of our time and go to our two uh, final onstage uh, questions. And I believe uh, the first one is for uh, Mr. Blair. A uh, student at the Monk School of uh, Global Affairs. Introduce yourself and uh, ask your question to Mr. Blair. Yes, good evening. My name is Jonah Cantor. Um, and my question pertains to something that's come up uh, earlier this, week, this evening. Um, religion on both sides uh, is often seen as an obstacle to peace in the Middle East. And I was wondering uh, what role you believe um, faith can play in a positive manner um, in helping to bring peace between Israelis and Palestinians. Um. Well, I remember a, a, a few months back, I was, uh, I was in um, and, and Jericho, and, and when you, you go out from Jericho, they, um, they, they took me up to, um, we went to visit the, the Mount of Temptation, uh, which is where I think they take all the politicians. Um, and, 
the, the guide that was, that was showing us around, the Palestinian guide, he suddenly stopped at one point and he said, um, this part of the world, he said, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, why did they all have to come here? Um, <laughs> and I sort of said, well, supposing they hadn't, would everything be fine? And he said, oh, probably not. Um, but, you know, the, the religious leadership uh, can play a part in this. For example, I don't think you will get a resolution of the issue of Jerusalem unless, which is a, a, a sacred and holy city to, to all three Abrahamic faiths, unless people of faith are prepared to try and find common ground so that they are entitled to, to, to worship um, in the way that they, they wish. And it's correct that in both Israel and Palestine, you see examples of, of religious fundamentalism um, and people espousing and doing um, extreme things as a result of their religion. But I can also tell you that there are rabbis and, and people of the Muslim faith on the Palestinian side who are desperately trying to find common ground and ways of, of working together. And I think you know, part of the, the issue and the reason indeed for me starting my, my faith foundation is that we can argue forever the degree to which what is happening in the Middle East is the result of religion or the result of politics. But one thing is absolutely clear, that without those of religious faith playing a positive and constructive role, it's going to be very difficult to reach peace. So my view, again, and I think this is in a sense one of the, the debates that underlies everything we've been saying this evening, is if it is correct that you're not going to simply eliminate religion, you know, you're not going to drive religion out of the world, then let's work on how we make those people of different faiths, even though they believe that their own faith is the, is the path so they believe to salvation, how they can work across the faith divide in order to produce um, respect and understanding and tolerance. Because believe it or not, amongst all the examples of, of prejudice and bigotry that, that Christopher quite rightly draws attention to, there are also examples of people of deep religious faith, Jewish, Muslim and Christian, who are desperately trying to search for peace and with the right political will supporting that, who would play a major part in achieving peace. So I agree, a religion has in one, in, to one degree created these problems, but actually people of different religious faiths working together can also be an important part of resolving these problems. And that's what we should do and it's what we can do. And in respect of Jerusalem, it is absolutely imperative that we do do. Visitor goes to the Western Wall. Anything he can do. Visitor goes to the Western Wall, uh, sees a man tearing at his beard, banging his head on the wall, shoving messages into it, rate of knots, wailing and flailing, watches with fascination. When the guy finally breaks off, he says, excuse me, I couldn't help noticing you were being unusually uh, devout in your addresses to the wall, <coughs> um, to, the, to, to the divine. Um, could, do you mind if I asked you um, what you were praying for? He said, I was praying that there should be peace, that there should be mutual love and respect between all the peoples in this area. And he said, and what do you think, says the visitor. He said, well, it's like talking to the wall. Um, <laughs> but there are people who think talking to walls is actually a form of divine worship. In this problem. And it's another instance, uh, now, not that I didn't bring it up laboriously myself, but I don't mind it again, of the difference between Tony and myself when he says, he uses his giveaway phrase, in the name of religion, rather than as a direct consequence of scriptural authority which is what I mean when I talk about this. Are you, no one's going to deny, are they? No one is going to deny there are awards of real estate made in the Bible by none other than Jehovah himself. That land is promised to human primates over other human primates in response to a divine covenant. <coughs> Do excuse me. <coughs> Sorry, this sometimes happens. Um, <coughs> no, that can't be denied. Um, when David Ben-Gurion was Prime Minister of what he still called a secular state, he called in Yigal Yadin and Finkelstein and the other Israeli archaeologists, professional guys, and said, go out into the desert and dig up the title deeds to our state. 
you'll find our legit. That was the instruction to the Department of Archaeology. They went, after they conquered Sinai and West Bank, they went even further afield, looking for some evidence Moses had ever been there. They didn't find any because there never has been and there never will be any. But you cannot say that the foundational cause, casus belli in this region, the idea that God intervenes in real estate and territorial disputes isn't inscribed in the text itself. And not only in the Jewish text, but thanks to a foolish decision taken in the early Christian centuries where it was decided not to dump the New Testament but it, um, and to start again just with the Nazarene story. Great Christian theologians like Marcion were in favor of doing that. Why do we want to bring the darkness and tyranny and terror and death and blood and cultism of the first books along with us? Surely we should start again. No, no, we're saddling ourselves with all that. So this is a responsibility for the Christian world too. And need I add that there is no good Muslim who does not say that Allah tells us we can never give up an inch of Muslim land, and that once our mosques are built, there can be no, there can be no retreat. It would be a, a betrayal. It would, be, it would lead you uh, straight to hell. In other words, yes, yes, they gibber and jabber, all of them, the three religions. Yeah, yeah, you're quite right. God awards land. It's just you've got the wrong title. <laughs> no. This is what I mean when I say the religion is a real danger to the survival of civilization, and that it makes this banal regional national dispute which if reduced to its real proportions is a nothingness, if it makes that not just lethally insoluble, but makes, is drawing in other contending parties who s really wish, openly wish, for an apocalyptic conclusion to it, as also bodied forth in the same scriptural texts. In other words, that it will be the death of us all, the end of humanity, the end of the world, the end of the whole suffering veil of tears, which is what they secretly want, this is a failure of the parties of God, and it's not something that happens because people misinterpret the text. It's because they believe in them. That's the problem. Thank you. Tony, would you like a quick rejoinder, or can I move on to our final question for this session? If you like. Well, great. We have, a, uh, I think, the, the perfect <laughs> final <laughs> question. Um, and it's from uh, another student at the Monk School for Global Affairs, uh, Dana Wagner. Where are you, Dana? Here you are. Um, a big part of uh, this issue is our inability to stand in another's shoes uh, with an open mind to understand a different worldview. In this regard, can each of you tell us which of your opponent's arguments is the most convincing? Thank you. <laughs> Hmm, right. <laughs> now, this definitely never happened in the House of Commons. <laughs> um, I think that the most uh, convincing argument is, and the argument that people of faith have got to deal with, is actually the argument that Christopher's just made, which is that the bad that is done in the name of religion is intrinsically grounded in the scripture of religion. Right? That is the single most difficult argument. And since I've said it's a really difficult argument, I suppose I better give an answer to it. Um, my answer to it is, is this, that there is, of course, that debate that goes on within religion, which is the degree to which, as it were, you look at scripture, abstracted from, from its time, um, you pick out individual parts of it, you use those in order to justify whatever view you like, or whether, as I tried to do in my opening, you actually say, well, what is the essence of, of that faith? And what is the essence of Scripture? And, of course, then what you realize is that, yes, of course, if you um, believe uh, as a Muslim that we should live our lives according to the seventh century, then you will end up with some very extreme positions. But actually, there are masses of Muslims who completely reject that as a view of Islam and instead say, no, of course, the prophet back then was somebody who brought order and stability and actually for, for example even though um, we today would want equality for women and, and many again despite what people say many Muslims would agree with that as well and many Muslim women obviously um, 
back then, actually, what he did was, was extraordinary for that time. And also, when you look at Christianity, yes, of course, you can point to, to issues that of that time now seem very strange and outdated. But on the other hand, when you take Christianity as a whole and ask what it means to those, you know, what draws people to it? You know, what, what is it that made um, me as a, uh, as, a, as, a, as a student come to Christianity? It wasn't to do with some of the things that, that um, Christopher has just been describing. And, you know, I understand that that's, um, th there are those traditions within religion. I understand that. I accept that. I, I see how people look at certain parts of Scripture and draw those conclusions from it. But it's not what it means to me. It's not the essence of it. The essence of it is through the life of, 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 of Jesus Christ is a life of, of love and selflessness and sacrifice. And that's what it means to me. And, and so I think the most difficult thing for people of faith is to be able to explain scripture in a way that makes sense to people in the modern world. And one of the things that we have actually uh, begun recently is a, is a dialogue called The Common Word, which is about Muslims and Christians trying to come together and through scripture find a common basis of cooperation and mutual respect. So, you know, yes, it is a difficult argument. That is the most difficult argument, I, I agree. But I also think there is an answer to it. And I think one of the values, actually, of having a debate like this, and in a sense having someone making that point as powerfully as Christopher has made it, is that it does force people of faith to recognize that we have to deal with this argument, to take it on, and to make sure that it, not just in what we are trying to do, but in how we interpret our faith, we are making sure that what I describe as the essence of faith, which is serving God through the love of others, is indeed reflected, not just in what we do, but in the doctrines and the practice of our religion. Uh, admirable th question. Thank you for it. Um, the uh, remark Tony made that I most agreed with this evening, I'll just hope that doesn't sound too minimal, was when he said that if religion was to disappear, things would by no means, as it were, automatically be okay. I mean, he phrased it better than that. But <clears throat> it would be what I regard as a necessary condition would certainly not be a sufficient one. In any way, religion won't disappear. I just think the hold of it on people's minds can be substantially broken and domesticated. Um, he's quite right about that, of course. Um, I hope I didn't seem at any point to have argued to the contrary. I come before you, after all, as a materialist. If we give up religion, <clears throat> we discover what actually we know already, whether we're religious or not, which is that we are somewhat imperfectly evolved primates on a very small planet in a very unimportant suburb of, the, of a solar system that is itself a negligible part of a very rapidly expanding and blowing apart uh, cosmic phenomenon. <clears throat> These conclusions to me are a great deal more awe-inspiring than what's contained in any burning bush or horse that flies overnight to Jerusalem or any other of that. It's a great deal more awe-inspiring, as is any look through the Hubble telescope at what our real nature and future really is. So he was quite right to say that, and I would have been entirely wrong if I'd implied otherwise. I think I could say a couple of things for religion myself, would in fact. First is what I call the apotropaic. We all have it, the desire not to be found claiming all the credit. A certain kind of modesty, you could almost say humility. Um, people will therefore say they'll thank God when something happens that they are grateful for. Or There's no need to make this a religious thing. The Greeks had the concept of hubris as something to be avoided and criticized. But I, what, I, what the Greeks would also have called the apotropaic, the, the, the view that not all the glory can be claimed by a load of primates like ourselves is a healthy reminder too. Second, the sense that there's something beyond the material or if not beyond it, um, 
not entirely consistent materially with it is, I think, a very important matter. What you could call the numinous or the transcendent or at its best, I suppose, the ecstatic. Um, I wouldn't trust anyone in this hall who didn't know what I was talking about. We know what we mean by it um, when we think about certain kinds of music, perhaps. Certainly the, the relationship or the coincidence, but sometimes very powerful between music and love. Um, landscape, uh, certain kinds of artistic um, and creative work that appears not to have been done entirely by hand. Without this, uh, we really would merely be uh, primates. I think it's very important to, to appreciate the, the finesse of that, and I think religion has done a very good job in enshrining it in music and in architecture, not so much in painting, in my opinion. Um, <laughs> and, I, and I think it's actually very important that we learn to distinguish the numinous um, in this way. I wrote a book about the Parthenon, I'll mention it briefly. I couldn't live without the Parthenon. I don't believe any civilized person could. If it was to be destroyed, you'd feel something much worse than the destruction of the first temple had occurred, it seems to me. But, um, and, well, and we'd have lost an enormous amount besides by way of our knowledge of symmetry and grace and, and harmony. Um, but I don't care about the cult of Pallas Athena. It's gone. And as far as I know, it's not to be missed. The Eleusinian mysteries have been demystified. The, the sacrifices, some of them human, that were made to those gods uh, are regrettable but have been blotted out and forgotten. And Athenian imperialism is also a thing of the past. What remains is the fantastic beauty and the faith that built it. The question is well, how to keep what is a value of this sort in, in art and in our own emotions and in our finer feelings, the numinous, the transcendent, I'll go as far as the ecstatic, and to distinguish it precisely from superstition and the supernatural, which are designed to make us fearful and afraid and servile, and which sometimes succeed only too well. Thank you. Well, it's now time for the final act in our debate, closing statements. We'll do that in the reverse order of our opening remarks. So, Christopher, I'm going to call on you again to speak. Your closing remarks, please. I'm not ready. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know it was coming. Um, and, uh, Tony, what do you say? Would you rather have another question? There's so many people who've got them. I'm, I'm happy. I'd rather answer way. another question. Let's take another question. Okay. In other words, don't run away with the idea I'd run out of stuff, okay? <laughs> Just, I'd rather be provoked. Um, someone could do that. Sure. Well, let's do that. Um, and I guess we'll give uh, Christopher uh, a pause here, a chance to, to drink and catch his breath. And Tony, uh, go to you on this, the, the whole question of, which has been at the center of this debate, on the rigidity or flexibility of religious doctrine. Uh, your church, the Catholic Church, has, has just uh, made a reversal of sorts on its policy around uh, the use of condoms, uh, allowed explicitly and only for the prevention of HIV AIDS uh, infection. Is that, um, is that a positive? Is that a, an expression of, of flexibility or a critique of, of the decades of rigidity before this uh, reversal? Well, I welcome it. Um, but you know, I mean, I'm a, a, one of the, uh, I think, billion uh, lay Catholics. So I don't, and I think many, many Catholics have, have different views on a whole range of issues. Um, upon which there is, there is teaching by, by the church. Um, I just wanted to pick up something, if, 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 if I might, that, that uh, Christopher said, because I thought his, his discussion of the transcendent was very interesting, actually. I mean, for those of us of religious faith, we, um, we acknowledge and, and, and believe that there is a power higher and separate from human power. Um, and in a way, what Christopher is saying is, well, I, don't, I can't accept that, but I do accept there is, there is something transcendent in the human experience and something numinous, something even um, the, ecstatic. You see, f for me, the, it, the belief in, in, a, in a higher power and the fact that we should be a 
uh, obedient to the will of, of that power, not simply our own will. I don't regard that as putting me in a position of, of civility, is not the word I would use. I would use the word obligation. And, you know, when I, it, it, it is of course absolutely true that when I can point to any of the, the acts that I say are inspired by religious faith, you can say, well, they could easily have been inspired by, by humanism. But I think that for those of us that are of faith and, and do believe that, um, that there is something actually more than simply the, the human power, this does give you, I think, a humility. It's not all that can give you a humility, but it does. I think, and I have witnessed this myself, I remember actually again to refer to Northern Ireland when I um, met some of the people who were um, the relatives of those who died in the Oma bombing, which came actually after the Good Friday Agreement and was the, the worst terrorist attack in the history of Northern Ireland. And I went to, to visit uh, the relatives of the victims, and I remember a man saying to me um, that who, who, who had lost uh, his loved one in, 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 the, in the bombing, saying to me, you know, I have prayed about this, and I want you to know that this terrible act should make you all the more determined to reach peace and to not stop your quest for peace. And it is completely true that of course he could have come to such an extraordinary, and I would say transcendent view of f f forgiveness and um, um, uh, compassion um, without religious faith. But it was what led him to that. And so I think you can't ignore the fact that for many of us, actually religious faith is what shapes us in this direction and not because we are servile or base our, our religious faith on superstition or contrary to reason, indeed, uh, which is why I've never seen a contradiction between Darwin and, and being someone of religious faith. But we do genuinely believe that it impels us in a way that is, 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 is different and more imperative, in a sense, um, than anything else in our lives. And, you know, in a way, we wouldn't be being true to ourselves unless we, we admitted that. So that doesn't mean to say that someone who is of no religious faith couldn't be just as good a person, and that is I do not claim for an instant that anybody who is religious, of, of religious faith is in some way um, a superior or better person than someone who isn't. But I do say that religion can and does in the lives of millions, actually hundreds of millions, in fact billions of people, does give them an impulse to be better people than otherwise they would be. I would ask for your closing statement. Five minutes for each. your closing oh, statement each. each. Yep. So um, now uh, on to our closing <coughs> statements. Uh, Christopher, you will begin. Okay. You have uh, five minutes uh, on the clock. I think I, a way I might do it actually is by commenting on what, on what Tony just said because he succeeded in doing what I had hoped I might get him to do earlier, which is to be allow, me, allow me to drive him back onto the territory of metaphysics with which I began, because we did need to transcend that and thus to get beyond questions like, well, are religious people good, are they bad, and other things very, that are very important, <clears throat> does religion make them behave better or worse, and so forth. Um, I'll give you, and I'll challenge Tony on an example, I mentioned earlier our, our attachment to the labor and uh, socialist movement in our, in, in our lifetimes. For a very long time, we had in that movement a challenger, apparently from the left, um, the communist movement, which has only been dead a very short time now. It actually hasn't died everywhere yet. And which said it had a much more comprehensive and courageous and thoroughgoing answer than we did to the problems created by capitalism and imperialism and other things. And, really proposed a fighting solution. And if I was to point to you the number of heroic people who believed in that, and the number of wonderful works of, of uh, especially of fiction, uh, novels 
an essay is written by people who believed in it, you, you, you could probably all of you mention uh, one of your own. If you were a Canadian, I hope they still teach about him in school, the great example of, of Norman Bethune, heroic doctor who went to volunteer in China during the Civil War on the communist side, uh, did amazing work, invented a, a form of battlefield blood transfusion. Just one among many examples, it was the communists in many parts of Europe who barred the road to fascism in Spain and uh, felt kept Madrid for many years from falling to Franco and Hitler and Mussolini. Gandhi may take credit for the Indian independence movement, too much in my view, but no one would deny the tremendous role played by the Indian communists in doing this, in, in uh, helping to break the challenge, break, excuse me, break the hold of Great Britain on, on their country. Um, as a matter of fact, some people find it embarrassing to concede this, but I don't, as a supporter of it myself, the African National Congress, Nelson Mandela's party, at least half of its members of the Central Committee and the Executive were, were members of the Communist Party until quite recently, very probably including Mandela himself. There's no doubt about it. There was real heroism and dignity and humanism to those people, but we opposed it. We said, no, it won't work. Why won't it work? It's not worth the sacrifice of freedom that it implies. It implies that all these great things can only be done if you'll place yourself under an infallible leadership. Uh, one that, once it's made a decision, has made that decision and you are bound by it. You might conceivably notice where I'm going here. Um, <laughs> it's why many of the people, the brilliant intellectuals who did leave it, left it very often for as, as high reasons of principle as they joined it in the first place. And the names of their books are legion and legendary. The best known is called The God That Failed. Uh, precisely because it was an attempt at a bogus form, a surrogate of religion. But let no one say, and when the history comes to be written, no one will be able to say that it didn't represent some high points in human history. But I repeat, it wasn't worth it at the sacrifice of mental and intellectual and moral freedom. And that was the purpose of my original set of questions on the metaphysical side. Are you, consider yourselves and consider this carefully, ladies and gentlemen, brothers, sisters, comrades, friends. Are you, are you yourselves willing, for the sake of certain elements of the numinous, perhaps for a, a great record of good works, as it's proposed by Tony, are you willing to say that you give your allegiance to an ultimate redeemer? Because you're not really religious if you don't believe that there is a divine supervision involved. You don't have to believe it intervenes all the time. If you don't believe that, you're already halfway out the door. You don't need me. <laughs> but are you willing to pay the price of a permanent supervisor? Are you willing to pay the price of believing in things that are supernatural? Um, miracles, uh, afterlives, uh, angels. Are you willing to admit, <clears throat> perhaps this most of all, are you willing to admit that human beings can be the interpreter of this divine figure? Because a religion means that you will have to follow someone who is your religious leader. You can't try as you may follow Jesus of Nazareth. It can't be done. You can try and do it, it can't be done. You'll have to follow his vicar on earth, Pope Benedict XXVI as presently. The, his own claim, not mine. The apostolic succession, the vicar of Christ on earth. You'll have to say, this person has divine authority. I maintain that that and what goes with it is too much of a sacrifice of the mental and intellectual freedom that is essential to us to be tolerated. And you gain everything by repudiating that and standing up to your own full height. And you gain much more than you will by pretending that you're a member of a flock or in any other way, any kind of sheep. Thank you. Just um, when Chris was talking there about um, the times in the Labour Party together, I was just uh, recalling um, after we suffered our fourth election defeat in a, in a row um, in, in the Labour Party, um, meeting a party member after the fourth defeat who said to me, the people have now voted against us four times. What is wrong with them? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, um, and you know, I would, uh, 
<laughs> I would say that um, actually the example of communism shows that those that want to suppress freedom, um, those who have a, a, a fanatical view of the way the world should work, those are not confined to the sphere of religious faith, I'm afraid. Um, it is there in many, many different walks of life. So the question is, um, for me, uh, this is not about how I, um, with a belief in, in as me, for me as a Christian, with a belief in Jesus Christ, not how that makes me subject to oppression and servitude, but on the contrary, how that helps me find the best way of expressing the best of the human spirit. And it was actually Einstein who um, was not an atheist, in fact. He believed in the supreme being, although he did not um, necessarily subscribe to organized religion, who said religion without science is, is blind. Um, but he also went on to say science without religion is lame. And I would say that, you know, for me, faith is not about certainty. It is in part a reflection, indeed, of my own uh, awareness of my own ignorance. And that though life's processes can be explained by, by science, um, nonetheless, the meaning and purpose of life cannot be. And in that space, for me at least, lies not certainty in the scientific sense, but a belief that is clear and insistent, and I would say rational, which is that there is a higher power than human power, and that higher power causes us to lead better lives in accordance with a will more important than our own, not in order that we should be imprisoned by that superior will, but on the contrary, so that we can discipline and use our own will in furtherance of the things that represent the best in human beings and the best in humanity. So I think this debate this evening has been a fascinating and I think deeply important debate about probably the single most important issue of the 21st century. I actually don't think the 21st century will be about fundamentalist political ideology. I accept it could be about fundamentalist religious or cultural ideology. And the way that we avoid that is for those people of faith actually to be prepared to stand up and to debate those people who are of none. And for those people who believe in a world of peaceful coexistence, where people do cooperate together, recognize that there are people with deeply held religious convictions and that those convictions impel them to be part of that world of peaceful coexistence, even though it is true. There are those who in the name of religion and indeed, you know, as a consequence of religion, will sometimes do things that are horrific, bad, evil, and in my view, totally contrary to the true meaning of faith. So I don't stand before you tonight and say that those of us of religious faith have always done right, since that is plainly wrong. But I do say that throughout human history, there have been examples of people inspired by faith that have actually, rather than contributed to the suppression of humanity, contributed to its liberation, spiritually, emotionally, and even materially. And it is those people that I stand up for here with you tonight. Thank you.
Well, ladies and gentlemen, let me reiterate something that uh, Peter Monk said at the beginning of this evening's talk. It is one thing to get up and give a set piece speech on a subject that you're intimately familiar with. It's something quite entirely different, though, to appear at a, a public event, a global event such as this, to have your ideas uh, contested and combated by someone who is every inch your peer, and to do so with the eloquence and conviction of our two debaters. So please join me in a round of appreciation.